And I was talking a few weeks ago to a friend of mine, old friend, I hadn't seen him in, in close to uh, six or seven years probably, and uh, we were friends up in Mount Pleasant. He was in a ministry called Chi Alpha, which is the uh, uh, Assembly of God Campus Ministry Outreach in, at Central. And uh, I was working for Standing the Gap there at the time when we were uh, when we were good friends. And he came down, we were talking about different things, and he, he kind of shared his insight that he had about uh, the prophet Nahum and uh, uh, as it related to, to Jonah. And I never really thought about that uh, in that connection before, but I got to look at him, uh, and he was right about some things. So I, I kind of stole some of the sermon from him. Uh, his name's Mike Wilson, so I should give credit where credit to but uh, I, was, uh, I realized I hadn't looked at Nahum for a while, and so I went back to it, and uh, I, this is some, some neat stuff, I think. I want to give you a little bit of background to, uh, to what's going on in both of these books. Jonah and Nahum were both prophets uh, that uh, are, their, their writings are what are called the minor prophets, uh, the last 12 books of the Old Testament. And they're called minor prophets not because they were less important than the major prophets, but because they wrote shorter books. If you wanted to be a major prophet, you had to write more. Yes, that worked. Uh, and if you didn't write as much, then you were a minor prophet. So Jonah's book is four chapters, Nahum's book is three chapters. And uh, they're in the book of the Twelve. They lived and prophesied probably uh, 100 or 150 years apart from each other. Jonah was first. And they were both sent... Uh, well, Nahum not so much sent, but they both spoke to Nineveh, <clears throat> or about Nineveh, which was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, at least in, uh, in the latter part of the Assyrian Empire. Nineveh was the capital city. And I want to tell you a few things about Assyria before we get into either of these two prof uh, prophets. Uh, Assyria was one of the mightiest empires of the ancient world. Uh, at the time it was flexing its muscles the biggest, it was probably uh, the strongest force, at, uh, at least one of the strongest forces the world had known. Up to that point, it beat Egypt. Uh, the, Egypt was a really powerful empire at one time, you probably uh, saw the Prince of Egypt or something like that, and know that uh, Egypt had a lot of cool stuff going on, and a lot of not so cool stuff going on, and it was a really strong country, and Assyria was the one who pretty much put a stop uh, to Egypt as uh, a big time world power for a while. And Assyrians had a foreign policy that was well, brutal, uh, to be honest. It, it was, uh, they were a tough, iron-fisted regime. When they conquered a people, they, uh, they really loved to humiliate them. And they, would, they, they took any kind of resistance as a, apparently a really personal insult. And so the, the rulers of Assyria, once they conquered a people, uh, they had a lot of fun uh, inflicting damage upon the conquered people. They would take the leaders, for example, and they had, they had people, this is a little graphic, and I'm sorry for that, but just to give you an idea of what Assyria was about, they had people who were specialists at filleting humans, uh, peeling the skin off of people while they were alive. And they do it in such a way that the person who was being skinned didn't lose consciousness, so that they would be sure to feel every slice. Uh, and then they would hang these hides uh, that they had skinned off other humans on their city gates. And uh, they would impale people and do other things to just kind of declare their victory and inspire fear and uh, terror in the people that they conquered. And the reason we know about this stuff, mostly, comes from the Assyrians' writings themselves. They would carve these pictures of their victories and their conquests on these statues and things that surrounded, uh, especially their capital city, Nineveh, so that everybody who came would see that the king of Assyria had had this other king skinned alive. They would, they would do things, they, they'd like to maim their captives too. They'd pull out all their teeth, or they'd cut off their nose, or they'd chop off their fingers and their toes. They, they would disfigure people on purpose just so that they would... Uh, know that Assyria could do whatever it is they wanted to. And then they boasted about these things in their, in their records. It's like I said, most of what we know about Assyrians practice like that comes from the Assyrians' own records. They like to let people know. And so they were a very brutal regime. Another thing that you've probably heard about that they did was when they conquered a, a people, they developed this, uh, this theory about uh, governing an empire that said people are easier to pacify, they're easier to rule, if you take them away from their homeland and put them someplace that they don't understand as well, that they don't know the lay of the land as well. You know, if you're an occupying army, uh, you are kind of the stranger in the homeland of the people you're occupying. And they're always going to know the territory better than you. And so they're always going to cause you problems and they're difficult to rule. 
But if you uproot them and put them in some other place, if you conquer Michigan and you move everybody from Michigan into Arkansas and you take the people from Arkansas and you put them in Maine, then the, they're easier to, to, to occupy. They're easier to, to control because they don't know the territory any better than you do and they, uh, they don't know where to hide and where all this stuff is. And so that's what the Assyrians did. They, they would ship people in and out uh, of their <coughs> occupied territories. And that's why we talk about, the, when you hear expressions like the 10 lost tribes of Israel, that's where they came from. When Assyria, Assyria finally conquered Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BC, and they shipped the people uh, who lived there uh, to some other part of their empire, and they were absorbed into the population of Assyria, and they shipped some other people in uh, to what had been Israel, and that's where the Samaritans came from that you read about in the New Testament, was these, these people who uh, were moved in by the Assyrian army to live where uh, the Israelites had been living, and they... When the Assyrians took people, usually they took down the cream of the crop. Anybody who was wealthy, anybody who was educated, anybody who was intelligent, uh, they would take those folks away, and they would leave a lot of times the peasants and, and things like that who weren't going to cause, uh, they thought, too much trouble. And so these foreigners intermarried with uh, Israelite peasants who had been left, and then this kind of half Israelite, half foreigner um, group of people came along and that were the Samaritans because they lived in the capital city of so um, that was a kind of par for the course for Assyria. They, they did stuff like that. And so uh, just based on what I've described there, do you think Assyrians were well liked by people around them or, or not so well liked? <laughs> they, they, they weren't well thought of on the international scene. They, they weren't rooted for it, uh, mostly. Uh, they imposed heavy tribute on anybody who, who was their kind of vassal. They would let some kings keep their countries, but they had to pay a lot of taxes. They had to, uh, these conquered kingdoms had to offer uh, troops to Assyrian armies to go help them conquer other countries. And Nineveh was built into this capital city, and, and they went all out when they built Nineveh. The, the, king, the kings that uh, were living in Nineveh built these big palaces. They had a zoo in Nineveh. This is two, you know, this is, yeah, two, three thousand years ago. They had a zoo, they had incredible waterworks, they had parks, they had gardens, they had all this treasure that would be shipped in from every place uh, that they conquered. They used a lot of slaves to build all these massive things and the slaves came from these conquered places. And so Nineveh uh, was this gorgeous city built on the backs of slave labor and extortion and incredible cruelty. And so when diplomats or other people from the countries that Assyria kind of controlled and uh, had sway over would come into the capital city to pay homage to the king, uh, they would see these massive structures and see some of maybe their countrymen or, uh, or their relatives <coughs> in slavery who, who built this over the generations. And so uh, Nineveh was this, this place of great wickedness. So you can, knowing that maybe helps put a little bit more light into the story of Jonah, right? So when Jonah gets this call, uh, and, and this is a story we grow up hearing about in Sunday school, right? That, God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh. And Jonah right away says, I don't want to go to Nineveh. And he gets on a boat and heads the other way. Right? <laughs> and we all think, reading this in Sunday school, well, what's the matter with Jonah? If God calls you to go, you got to go. What's he thinking running away from God? And then we read the story about how, Nineveh, how you know, Jonah gets swallowed by the big fish and then is in the belly of the big fish for three days. And then he gets spit up and finally repents and goes uh, and preaches to Nineveh and has this massive success in his ministry, right? This preaching that Jonah does results in the conversion of 120,000 people uh, to, to God's ways and, and apparently even maybe some of the cattle as well. And we, we hear this story and, and Jonah, instead of being so ecstatic uh, about his successful preaching uh, revival services, uh, he's really angry and God comes to, to Jonah and says, why are you so angry? And this is where we give Jonah a hard time because he's, he's mad that all these people repented. And he tells God, uh, this is why I didn't want to go. It wasn't because I was afraid of the Ninevites. It was because I hate them. <laughs> and I want them dead. And I knew that you would forgive them uh, if, I, if I did this. And they repented. And I wanted them smited. And you didn't smite them. Smith. Smith. I wanted them smoked. I wanted Sodom and Gomorrah action. <laughs> and it, it didn't happen. 
And so we say, Jonah, you're such a jerk. What's going on with you? Because God does the thing with the vine, right? The vine and the worm, and the worm chews the vine, and the vine, the vine. Where there's something giving you a really uh, whoa, condensed version of Jonah. But if you understand how Israelites felt about Assyrians, and the Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria, you start to see a little bit more sympathy maybe for Jonah. At least understand, yeah, he disobeyed God, he got on the boat, went the other way, you know, and, and wasn't very compassionate to the Ninevites, but in Jonah's mind, they had it coming. They had it coming. And Jonah, being the full of patriotic zeal for his own land, he, he didn't want to see Nineveh get off so easy. So one of the first lessons that we can learn from Nineveh, I think, uh, out of looking at Jonah and Nahum, is that God has amazing compassion. Look with me, if you would, in Jonah chapter 4, verse 11. Now this is after, this is the end of the book. This is after Jonah has had this incredible success when Jonah preaches his message that we'll see uh, in, a, in a bit here back in chapter 3. Uh, we're going to be jumping around a lot through uh, Jonah and Nahum. That's why I didn't put any scriptures, any chapters and verses in the bulletin. Uh, but Jonah's had this incredible success uh, preaching to the Ninevites, and God has forgiven them, accepted their, their repentance and their contrition, and then God has taught them the lesson about this vine. And we'll pick up in Jonah chapter 4, verse 10. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this vine.